Bom dia a todos. Eu sou Laura Izarra, professora da Universidade de São Paulo e coordenadora da Cátedra William Butler Gates Chair of Irish Studies. E hoje daremos início às atividades acadêmicas de 2021. Aqueles que eh, gostariam de ter um certificado de presença, eh, vocês podem fazer a, a inscrição, eh, que se encontra, o link se encontra na descrição do YouTube. All right. Good morning, everybody. It's a great pleasure to me as coordinator of the William Butler Yates Chair of Irish Studies at the University of São Paulo, to thank you all for participating in the uh, 2021 academic activities in these times of distress and pain that the world is living due to the COVID-19 pandemic. Last year, the lockdown made us cancel at last minute St. Patrick's event at Tuesday which nearly marks the beginning of the chair's activities. Nevertheless, along last year, and we will continue this year, uh, we, have found, um, we have found out ways to keep the links of friendship and hopes alive, bringing together academics and the general public through courses, lectures, film streaming and interviews in times of social isolation. The, the support of the uh, Department of Foreign Affairs for the coming of Irish visiting professors, critics and writers since 1986, with Munira Mutran receiving all of them on ad hoc basis, um, such as the poet Paul Durkin, whose work is being celebrated today, and the establishment of the chair in 2009, now supported by the ESP program, were fundamental to consolidate the cooperation between the Embassy of Ireland, the Consulate General of Ireland and the University of São Paulo. I am delighted to offer this year an academic program that shows in its entirety the results of projects developed by the chair's researchers and former students of the postgraduate program of linguistic and literary studies in English at the, unit, at the Faculty of Philosophy, Letters and Human Sciences. To be brief, I would like to thank especially all our guest speakers in Ireland, um, a filmmaker and a writer uh, Alan Gilsonen, the actor Stephen Ray, uh, the historian Angus Mitchell, Professor Moina Sullivan, John Cunningham, Sarah Ann Buckley, Miriam Horton from Galway, in Spain, Professor Maria Amor Barros del Rio from Burgos University, and in Brazil, Professors Maria Silvia Berti, um, Aline Fernandes, uh, Rosalia Dad, uh, Gisele Volkov, and all the researchers of the chair, the film director Aurelio Michilis, whose documentary Secrets from the Putumayo will be discussed tomorrow, and his whole team of excellence, Andre Finotti, Andre Lawrence Michilis, Alvisi Migoto, and Patrick Leblanc. The whole program, including the launch of the Abbey Journal special issue and books, proves today how a dream has come true. So thus, to finish, I would like to echo the very well-known uh, verses of Yeats' poem that says, I have spread my dreams under your feet. Tread softly because you tread on my dreams. Now, I would like to call uh, Professor Adrian Pablo Fanjul head of the Department of Modern Languages and Literatures, uh, to welcome all of you uh, on behalf of the faculty, too. Thanks, Adrian, for being here with us. Muito obrigado. Obrigado. É, bom, é, senhor embaixador da... É, senhor embaixador da Irlanda, é, é, Sean Roy, é, senhor consul geral da Irlanda, Senhor Presidente da UCANI, Professor Valmor Tricoli, 
eh, señora coordinadora de la Cátedra de Estudios Finlandeses, eh, profesora Laura Izarra. Eh, bom, o nome da Faculdade de Filosofia, Letras e Ciências Humanas e do Departamento de Letras Modernas eh, é um grande prazer, uma grande honra eh, sediar este, este encontro que, eh, bom, inclui dentro da sua programação eh, primeiramente o lançamento de um número, um novo número de uma revista eh, o Anuário de Estudos Irlandeses que desde 1999 edita as professoras Munira Mutran, aqui presente, Laura Izarra, e que é uma das publicações de maior permanência entre as ligadas ao Departamento de Letras Modernas. Né? É, Para mim, uma, também um prazer abrir este encontro, não apenas pela, de, por uma parte pela sua qualificação acadêmica e também é, pela, pela significação política e cultural que tem é, neste momento. Né? Eh, no encontro haverá também, como, como podemos ver na programação, lançamentos de livros que têm a ver com a pesquisa conjunta, como parte da cooperação internacional, eh, com a produção do programa de pós-graduação em estudos de, eh, linguísticos e literários em inglês, como já antecipou a professora Laura, e a apresentação de um projeto de pesquisa conjunto. Né? Eh, bom... Eh, Penso na conferência sobre políticas públicas para o teatro em São Paulo, que dará nossa colega Maria Silvia Betti. Me pergunto, fico até assustado do que, é que ela pode nos informar sobre essas políticas eh, atuais, eh, neste momento tão sombrio. E eh, muito eh, feliz de que o encontro inclua essa projeção do documentário sobre Roger Kasemann, um pioneiro. Eh, irlandês da denúncia sobre o extermínio, sobre o ecocídio na, na Amazônia, de, que é de toda a América do Sul. Né? Bom, eh, então eu eh, dou as boas-vindas novamente à faculdade eh, e eh, desejo a todos vocês um ótimo encontro. Muito obrigado. Obrigada, Thank you, Professor Wall. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, it's a pleasure to be here today, even in a virtual mood. It's not really here, it's around for everybody. Um, um, dear Mr. Sean Hoy, Ambassador of Ireland, uh, dear Mr. Benes, also General of Ireland in Sao Paulo, Professor Adrian Trohul, um, Head of the Department of Modern Languages of the Faculty of Philosophy, Letters and Human Sciences. It's funny to uh, to say that in English. We usually say Fefalesh, but it's, this is a Portuguese version of the faculty. And my dear friend, Professor Laura Zaha, uh, coordinator of this chair, and also she's uh, the Vice President of Alcan, our international office. Then, on behalf of Alcan, I uh, would like to uh, give a warm welcome to all participants. If I'm not wrong, last time that we have this opening was in a face-to-face -face move, right? Um, I don't know if it is unfortunately, but um, we are getting used to these uh, virtual, these computer screen meetings. Uh, um, I'm pretty sure that the excitement, the commitment, and the quality of this event will not be compromised by this virtual mode. But it would be nice to shake hands and to uh, see some friends again. But that's the best that we can do right now. Um, first of all, I, I, I want to uh, thank uh, the Irish government and also the Faculty of Philosophy. Um, letters and human sciences for the constant support. I also have to thank Professor Laura Zaha for this uh, 12 years of hard work for, their, uh, for her efforts and an extremely nice job. And last but not least, I want to congratulate Professor Munira Mutan, who is the honorary director of the chair. Uh, I know I was doing my research about this chair and I know that she's uh, put a lot of efforts and a very nice job to, to organize this chair. 
Uh, I also know that we have several chairs in our university, but the chair of Ivory Studies is uh, truly remarkable. Uh, I was, as I said, I was doing my research on the number of professors, researchers, and students involved in this chair, and the volume and diversity of the activities very, I mean, very, very impressive. It's a, a recipe for success. Uh, I know that we have a lot of books, dissertations, theses, workshops, conferences, international mobility of the students, um, professors, researchers. Um, we also have a several agreements with very important Irish universities. Uh, I guess, uh, the, I guess, no, I'm pretty sure the University of Sao Paulo is pretty proud of this uh, chair. Um, as I said, it's an example of academic success and I wish a very long life for this chair. I cannot forget to mention that uh, it, it is an honor to receive the invitation uh, from the Consul General to participate in the Global Greening Project. Uh, and most people will be prepared to be part of it next year, illuminating uh, the clock tower. If you once visit our university, you know that the tower, the clock tower, is an important symbol of our university. And I hope that next year the tower will be green. Uh, finally, I wish all of you a St. Patrick's Day celebration with great joy and hope in these hard times of the pandemic. And it seems that it is okay if it's going to rain because we are going, <laughs> it's not going to be an outside celebration. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much for your kind words. And I would like now uh, to give the floor to Ambassador Sean Foy, who will give the opening, the official opening remarks uh, for this uh, opening of the activities of the chair. Munira, we cannot see you. You have to be here in person. <laughs> right. <laughs> okay. So, in the meantime, while we wait, it's an interesting, um, uh, interesting to know that this uh, next year we will be able to participate in this global greening. That is um, as, um, an opportunity that the Council of General uh, gives also to many other institutions around um, around Brazil uh, to green uh, the, the monuments. So perhaps a Consulate General Owen Venice would like to, to mention a bit of this uh, while we wait for Sean. <coughs> thank, thank you, Laura. And uh, thank you, uh, Valmore, for the very nice invitation to OSPI to green the clock tower next year. Uh, we, we'll be there in person. But as it happens, we managed to get Cristo Redentor uh, greened on Sunday evening. Uh, and we'll have some beautiful photographs to share and some lovely uh, uh, aerial footage of that uh, later on in the day uh, with you all and, and tomorrow during a virtual reception. But the Global Greening is a real opportunity, I guess, for us to, 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 to show the world uh, sort of, uh, the beautiful colour green of Ireland and, and it allows us the opportunity to sort of share it in the hope and positivity of the message that, that, that lies in the, the various greenings. I think Sean, the Ambassador Sean Boy is back with us now, uh, so I think uh, we can probably proceed to his remarks. Thanks, Laura. Thanks a lot. Sean. Uh, thank you. Can you hear me? Sorry, my my phone my phone froze um, when I was uh, just about to speak. So I, I really believe whoever can fix online technology is the modern equivalent of is there a doctor on the aeroplane? Because um, every everything depends on the skills of one person. But I'd like to thank to start by thanking thanking you, Laura and uh, Adrian and Valmore. Uh, who have all spoken before me. This is a, a great honour uh, to be involved for the third time. And as Professor Laura said, it's my third time, but we've only met once uh, actually in person. And that was in 2019 when we were joined by the Speaker of the House from Ireland. And indeed, the Speaker was in contact with us last week and he has passed on his regards to everybody. I think he, well, I know he has very close uh, and very warm memories of his visit to Brazil 
And indeed, during that visit, I presented him with one of our pictures of Roger Casement, which he he has framed and is in his office in Doyle Iron. And I visited him the last time I was home, and I can confirm that the picture is there. Um, I think t today's uh, and tomorrow's events are very, very rich, and they're also in depth and in diversity. And I'll, I'll come in a minute to uh, Paul Jorkin. But I think for me um, and for my colleagues in foreign affairs, a retelling and a reinterpretation of the Roger Kaysman story through Brazilian eyes or through Latino eyes is something that is very exciting to us. Because, uh, and I know Alan is, is online with us here, and we will in, um, we will have a session, especially with Angus and Stephen tomorrow. But in 2016, when we celebrated, commemorated the rising, we had real engagement around casement. And for it to come up, the story to come up again, but in the Latino context, in the Putumayo context, I think that's um, something that we all embrace. And I congratulate you, Aurelio, on a very, very uh, fine production and I can confirm that my colleagues, especially in the embassies in the Lusophone countries, are looking forward to supporting the distribution of, uh, of your production once it becomes available to the public. The overall message for us um, this year on St. Patrick's Day is one of hope. We thought last year that we would certainly meet this year. So we do not know what will happen next year when lots of other things will happen. Brazil will be 200 years of independence. Ulysses will be um, out of royalties. It will be 100 years old. Ireland will celebrate 100 years of independence. Lots of things on the horizon, but we simply do not know what is ahead of us. But um, I think in these COVID times, um, hope has to be our way forward and we have a tradition in Ireland of burning a candle in the window uh, symbolically to welcome the wanderer home as a guiding star but this can also be a light for our immigrants to come back and we commissioned this year um, candles from the Amazon which I hope you can see they were um, distributed here and in Sao Paulo we've received wonderful uh, feedback from many colleagues, all of the profits, 100% go to indigenous people in the Amazon. And I believe that Roger's, Roger Casement was uh, leaning over my shoulder when we had the discussion about this. And indeed, uh, more recently, when um, we agreed to make a presentation of 100,000 euro towards Cruz Vermelha Brasileiro for Amazonas for the COVID crisis. And um, these are things that I think where they, the links between Ireland and Brazil continue and get deeper. But I also think when I, when I think of the last year in COVID, it's really been the time when we have substituted our inability to meet with friends and family and to travel with books and film. And it has been the epoca of Netflix, C and Kindle. And perhaps it's a reality that when it becomes a choice between Netflix and Shakespeare, perhaps Netflix wins most of the time. And that's why we need more and more quality documentaries to enter into this space between. And the work of Aurelio and Alan before that are very, very important parts of that. Now we watch live sport without an audience, and this is the new normal. And um, Owen, who participated actively as a sportsman, and for those at this time of year, we're always watching our Irish rugby team to watch it on our own and for the players to participate in international games without a live audience is is really a very it really brings home in a sober way the challenges that we have collectively. But again, we have the hope because there will be another time. And I think that's why events like today are particularly important because they engage us. It's a time that we have to come together to discuss things because we, we are spending a lot of time on our own and we need to come together to discuss things, to engage, to argue, to disagree, 
But I have no doubt that at the end of uh, this particular session, um, tomorrow evening perhaps, that everybody that participates will be enriched in some way. And I have no doubt about that. And I, I think again of hope, you know, Roger Caseman spent many, many um, days and days of his life on long ship journeys, writing copious letters, which we're all um, very familiar with. But on those long journeys, that light in the distance, that idea of home, I think was very, very strongly um, associated with his whole life. And I think also for Paul Durkin, who visited uh, Brazil in 1999, and through his unique gift of poetry as a master poet, he gave us his own interpretation of what he sees here in Brazil. And um, we will have our official reception tomorrow. I hope everybody has been invited. For those of you that have not, we will we'll provide a link during the day. And um, this has been pre-recorded, but um, it will be broadcast live at five o'clock tomorrow in Brazilian time, eight o'clock in Ireland. And Susan will read one of uh, Paul's poems tomorrow. But she will read another one now, uh, as it has been a special request from Manira. And those of you that know Manira and uh, Laura and Marinella know that when you're asked something from these very seductive and powerful ladies, you cannot refuse. It is simply impossible. So I'd like to thank you all. Um, I've read Mariana's book on Casement as well. Every, every interpretation is an, an extra layer of clarity and richness. And um, you're part of our ever-growing Irish-Brazilian family. It's just a pity, as, um, as Adrian said, that we cannot meet later to discuss the day, to have that wine done, to have that analysis over a glass of wine. Or maybe the last time when we were in Sao Paulo, we had a little sidera of cachaça. I think you were there, Alan, but I'm not even mentioned that. But um, let me just finish with a little Irish Brazilianism. Ciao for now. So maybe I can hand over to Susan. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Sean. It's wonderful to be here with you all and to see you all. Um, Paul Durkin has got a very special place in my heart as I'm a good Mayo woman. And Paul comes from County Mayo. Indeed, many famous people worldwide have come from that poor county in the west of Ireland. And this is a beautiful poem I'm delighted to read and dedicate it especially to you, Muneer, today. Um, and uh, I can remember a long time ago, one of uh, Paul's first anthologies, Sean gave me as a present. And I was just thinking this morning, it's still by my bed at home in Ireland. And it's one of my go-to books. Anyway, this is called Man Walking the Stairs After Shaim Soutine by Paul Durkin. Odd to overhear you think I am saying man walking the stars. And all my life I have been saying man walking the stairs. Living alone in a semi-detached villa between the mountains and the sea, I spent a great deal of time on the stairs. Halfway up the stairs, I pause at the window overlooking the entrance to our cul-de-sac, the lancet window in our gable. I pause or climb on. When I get to the top of the stairs, I cannot remember why in the first place I came up the stairs. But that is the nature of living alone. I am neither perplexed nor perturbed. I go back downstairs and start all over again. Read another page, drink another cup of tea, hover at the kitchen window, Hover at the front window, hover in the hallway, hover at the letterbox, 
hover before the looking glass in the coat rack that we bought in Christie Birds for two and sixpence. I know what I must do. I must go back upstairs and search under my bed for that book I have mislaid, the Oxford Dictionary of Quotations. I am searching for a line from Don. Make my dark poem light. But I pause again at the gable window. This time to behold pine trees clutching at one another in a gale. A pair of pines were reprieved by the developer. Thank you. Uh, Thank you very much, Susan, for this present. We need, a, we need a, your your wish and your dream came true too. <laughs> okay. Well, thanks a lot, uh, Sean, also for your remarks, opening remarks, and then um, I would like to to add that uh, indeed uh, the chair of Irish studies is a continuation uh, and we walk hand in hand with the ABE, the association, the Brazilian Association of Irish Studies that now is directed, is chaired by Mariana Bolfarini, who was also our former students at the University of Sao Paulo and we are, we are very proud also of uh, continue working together. So we are uh, children of Munira and at the same time, uh, granddaughters of Munira. <laughs> Thanks a lot. And so I will pass uh, the floor to uh, Owen Benis, uh, Consul General of Ireland in Sao Paulo. Thank you. Thank you very much, Laura. And, and thank you, Susan, for a beautiful uh, recital of uh, the, that Paul Durkin poem, and I know uh, without re revealing too much that tomorrow's uh, recital is also just as exquisite, so I, I hope everybody looks forward to, to hearing that. And thank you also to Ambassador Hoy for, for very uh, very good and apt opening remarks. It, it, it's, I guess, first of all, to say good morning to you all for this the first round table of, of, the, of the two days program. Uh, it's uh, my first time to present uh, at the opening of this WBH chair of Irish studies, and I can assure you that it's, it's a real honor and, and, and privilege, especially on the eve of St. Patrick's Day, to launch this, this, this journal, a special issue that celebrates the, the work uh, of, of Irish poet or master poet as Ambassador Hoy uh, remarked uh, on his 76th birthday, Paul Durkin. Um, and indeed, the period around St. Patrick's Day, as, as we all know, offers us a unique and uh, wonderful opportunity to celebrate our Irishness through the sharing of Irish culture, poetry and literature. This morning's opening of the chair, our discussion to come on Paul Durkin's work and the really magnificent programme in place for the next two days is a wonderful, wonderful demonstration of this. The team here at a bay and the WBH chair, led by Professor Laura uh, Izara Munira Mutran and Mariana Balfourine, are invaluable drivers uh, of Irish studies in Brazil and South America as a whole. Their dedication to the study and promotion of Irish studies through poetry, literature, art, history is both inspiring and, and motivating. As the then Minister of State for Culture, Joe McHugh, very accurately remarked when opening the chair in 2018, Irish studies seems to know no boundaries in Latin America. I can assure you that the Constant, together with the Embassy, are most grateful for all that you do for Irish studies. We, valuable, we value our rich friendship immensely and look forward to the continued success of our strong partnership. Central to this is the Abay's Brazilian Journal of Irish Studies, previously a newsletter. The association has pr produced close to 25 journals, six of those special issues since 1999. The journal provides a truly learned and exceptional insight on all aspects of Irish studies, including Ulysses, Seamus Sini, Roger Cation, Yates, John Banville, and now Paul Durkin. It's a wonderful connection to Irish studies, which will help to empower and connect a younger generation of Brazilian academics working in this area. In, in a previous EBE event on John Banville, I mentioned Banville's drive to write the perfect sentence. With Paul Durkin, we find ourselves encountering yet another driven by perfection with his dream and poetry to get every word right. One only has to experience his poetry and listen to and feel his words to realize that he very much succeeds. A winner of the Irish Lifetime, the Lifetime Achievement of Irish Book Award, Durkin's poetry, some of it dark, 
covers a multitude of themes, from the mundane to the magnificent, the familiar to the peculiar. Indeed, warmth, loneliness, friendship, intensity, sadness and happiness are just some of the feelings and emotions that we encounter as we journey through his poems. Durkin's work provides us with some wonderful and illuminating insights into his varying levels of consciousness and unconscious way of thinking on life and all that it entails. He speaks of and embraces the weather, Ireland in 1916, feminism, the Celtic Tiger days, suicide, the WB Yeats shopping centre, divorce, the celebration of life, the loaf of a batch, the loaf of batch, and even to quote the title of his poem, the old guy in the aisle seat on a flight to Chicago. As we leave Ireland and with the journal opening Paul Durkin's poems around the world in mind, Durkin's work takes us on some amazing journeys throughout the world, with Argentina, France, Germany, Russia, Spain, and of course, Brazil, all featuring. His famous collection, Greetings to Our Friends in Brazil, takes us on a more intimate journey around Brazil, stopping along the way in Rio, Sao Paulo, Belo Horizonte, Ouro Preto, Recife, Batumi, Sam Ambia, and more. Included in this wonderful collection is a poem dedicated to one of our esteemed speakers today, Professor Manira Mutran. The daring middle-aged man on the flying trapeze provides a remarkable portrayal of a moment in the life of Durkin and his wish to hear declaiming Ulysses in Portuguese in Finnegan's pub in Sao Paulo and ultimately doing so under a host moon in Dublin. Without the dedication and passion of those promoting Irish studies, many here in Brazil may never have had the opportunity to experience and enjoy the poetry of Durkin. The art of translation is one thing, but the challenge and difficulty in translating poetry is altogether a different art. Literary translation is a hugely important task. It makes possible for most of us to enjoy and experience poetry in a real way. It helps to share our understanding of the world, our culture, history, philosophy, politics, and much more. The journal excels further as it explores the work of Durkin with an extraordinary lineup of international guest editors, with each providing a unique perspective on Durkin, the people's poet, as he is known by some. The second part of the journal looks at Paul's Dirk, Paul Durkin's poetry from the Irish and the international perspective, presenting original and republished essays by friends and scholars on Durkin's work from Ireland and abroad. While the third, the third part of the journal presents poems for a poet, with many, uh, many uh, esteemed writers, including uh, Celia De Freyne, Damien Grant, and Moya Cannon, uh, joining uh, Niall McManagall, Paul Muldoon, Kate Donovan, and the re recently deceased Derek Mann. Finally, uh, it must be appreciated that the journal is not just a one-way sharing of culture. In its sections, voices from Brazil, readers from abroad get a unique opportunity to experience the Brazilian culture and perspective. This special feature in the current special issue journal sees writer and scholar Helena Godoy contribute with an original piece that plays with the idea of Durkin dancing down to Brazil, a very fitting contribution. Friends, in celebrating Paul Durkin's 76th birthday and his works in this, the latest Abbey special issue journal, one cannot help but reflect on the strong and warm relationship between Durkin and Brazil, and the fact that it is in many ways coming full circle. Durkin celebrated this two-way relationship in exquisite style through his work, Greetings to Our Friends in Brazil. Today, Abe and the WBH Chair with Manira, Laura, Mariana, Alan, and all of the guest editors have reciprocated in similar style with this, the latest special issue, which in many ways can be considered Greetings to Our Friend in Ireland a treasured birthday gift. So before I introduce our first speaker, I would really like to, to ask Alan Gilson, a good friend of Paul Durkin, to share with us a special message from Durkin himself, a greeting to friends, to his friends in Brazil this morning. Paul, or Alan. Thank sir. you. Thank you. And, and thank you, Ambassador, for those inspiring remarks. And, and Susan, for that gorgeous reading. I know Paul would be particularly elated by that. And the Jeremiah woman, which is very important. Um, I spoke with Paul yesterday uh, and he was saying, how is all this thing going to work today? And I said, well, we're all going to meet, you know, on Google meetings or Zoom or Teams or something. And Paul stopped me there and he said, Alan, I don't understand any of those words. Uh, and Paul, of course, values his words deeply. So uh, that explains some somewhat why he isn't with us in person or virtually today, but he did ask me to share a message with you uh, at the at the outset of today's uh, proceedings. Um, and just before I read it, I, I, I remembered uh, the last time I was with you in Sao Paulo, before I left, uh, and that now with lockdown seems a very fond and very distant memory. But before I left, I went shopping 
with Paul. I took him shopping the day before I left to Tesco in Rings End. Uh, and as we often did, we would sit outside the supermarket in the car and talk about this and that. Um, you know, it, it, it's nearly a Paul Durkin poem uh, in itself, sitting outside Tesco, in, which is a supermarket chain. Uh, in Ring's End. But I, I remember saying that I was going to Sao Paulo the next day, and the one thing that Paul obsessively said is, if you meet Munira Mutran, you have to give her my love. And uh, indeed, I promised to do that. And in some ways, that was the, that meeting with Munira in Sao Paulo was the, the you know, the start or the seed of, of the journal that you have before you now. Um, and there's a theme here because uh, I'll read you Paul's message uh, for today. Beloved Munira, my warmest congratulations to you and the Brazilian Association of Irish Studies. Deepest gratitude to yourself and Alan and Mariana Bofrine. I can never forget that miraculous sunny June day when you introduced me to Sandy Manstrand, Sao Paulo and James Joyce. I rejoice with you all. God bless you, Paul Durkin. Thanks. Thank you, Alan, for what is a, a, a perfect a perfect message from Paul and, and a great scene setter. It helps us to get a real sense of the, the real uh, and, and the lovely friendships in place, I guess, between Ireland and Brazil, between Paul and Monira uh, and the rest of today's guests. Uh, I think we, we will have an opportunity to hear uh, Paul recite some of his work from clips taken from uh, various uh, films on the poet and we do look forward to hearing more from yourself Alan a little later but for now and I guess in the spirit of the global friendship uh, that that exists and and uh, listening and, and sort of reflecting on Paul's message to his beloved Munira uh, I'd like to introduce uh, our next speaker and our first speaker Professor Munira Mutran uh, when Manira began exchanging views, I guess, on Ireland and its writers with Sean O'Foylan back in the early 70s, I'm not sure she envisaged such success in Irish studies here in Brazil, but a wonderful success it's been and, and continues to be. As you know, Manira is Associate Professor of Literature here uh, in English at the USP. She's Brazil, uh, specialising in Irish literature and comparative studies. She holds an MA and a PhD and a postdoctoral thesis at the university and a degree of Doctor of Literature uh, at the National University of Ireland in Mayo. She was the co-editor of the Brazilian Journal of Irish Studies from 96 to 2018 uh, and, and of lectures, a series of books with lectures given at the WBH Chair of Irish Studies. She has published many articles and chapters and books on Irish fiction and drama, two collections of Irish short stories translated into Portuguese. And, and she also received in 2018 the Presidential Distinguished Service Award for her almost 40 years of commitment to Irish studies uh, at the University of Sao Paulo. Incredible achievements from somebody who is unwavering in her passion for and promotion of Irish studies here in Brazil with her long lasting friendship with Paul Durkin and the fact that she does have that poem dedicated to her and Durkin's Brazilian collection, uh, Professor Mudron is perfectly placed to get this morning's round table underway. So over to you, uh, uh, Professor Mudron. Thank you, Owen. Thank you, Alan. Thank you, Mariana, for taking part in this uh, round table. Before I begin, I would like to thank Susan for such an impressive reading of Man Walking the Stairs. For me, that man is a modern Sisyphus, going up, down, up and down. Thank you, Susan. Thank you very much. <coughs> In this session, I'd like to share with you my memories of Paul Durkin 25 years ago when he came to Brazil hoping that my memories reveal some facets of his very complex personality, such as a sense of humor and a deep interest in people, things, 
and places. His sense of humor can be seen, I just remember now, so that we don't cry, but laugh. Um, in his very short poem called Ireland 2001, where is my bikini? We'll be late for months. So that's the poem. <laughs> and um, In 1995, so let's go back in time. In 1995, there were two very important events for the future of our program of our studies at USP. The first one was the state visit of Mary Robinson, President Mary Robinson, to the University of Sao Paulo as an acknowledgement of what had been done here so far. And in June, we had Paul Durkin's visit, opening up uh, new fields of research in, in poetry. Um, during his stay in Brazil, uh, in our country, he traveled from north to south, from Belém to Joinville, and his memorable, as Owen uh, mentioned, his memorable, memorable experiences here would be remembered, reimagined, transformed in a book he wrote in 1999, Greetings to Our Friends in Brazil. That collection reveals that while traveling in a country as big as the continent, Paul lived through many unexpected turns. For example, in his city, he met an Irish priest, from Wexford, and Paul uh, had expected him to talk about his project about poor children in his parish. But what does this priest do? He recites Rage for Order by Derek Maham. Another example of uh, strange things happening was that while waiting for his flight to Rio, Paul was taught a lesson in the art of living by a nine-year-old black Shushan boy. And then, this has been mentioned as well, a very strange thing happening in Sao Paulo. I quote from his poem, on June the 16th, in Finnegan's pub in Sao Paulo, a Japanese actor will be declaiming in Portuguese, extracts from Ulysses. You will agree that this is a very strange thing. Um, now, uh, let, uh, let us remember his stay in Sao Paulo. When he arrived, 
he knew very well the places he wanted to see. After leaving his luggage at the hotel, we walked for hours in the old city center, Praça da Sé, Largo São Bento, Viaduto do Chá, Pátio do Colégio. And then he asked me to go to Rua Maria Antônia, the famous Rua Maria Antônia, to see the faculty of philosophy. And then I thought, of all places, why does he want to go to Rua Maria Antônia? And then he explained, I want to, to see where Fernando Henrique Cardoso has studied. Fernando Henrique Cardoso, as you know, was our president a few years ago. And uh, you might be interested to know that he had another kind of uh, desire to see, to go to Cemitério da Consolação. Uh, and I said, why? <laughs> and he said, because uh, I think he was showing how attentively he had read his guidebook, because he said, there are many 19th century beautiful sculpture, sculptures in that graveyard. I myself hadn't seen those sculptures sculpture. So it was a kind of uh, revelation for me. And then we ended our sightseeing tour at Instituto Butantã at USP to see the snakes and to see the museum. So that's for the first day. On the second day, of course, poetry reading. It was a wonderful success. There were more than 60 people attending, friends, colleagues, uh, students, and many members of the Irish community in Sao Paulo. And they, everybody was surprised because he performed when he read from his poems. And they were surprised with the poems and also with the poet's uh, dramatic intensity. It was really, really, it is unforgettable. But I must tell you something funny happening during that session of poetry reading. Paul approached a student and asked her, and this student was Fernanda, who, who wrote about Yates. Um, he asked her to lean against the door all the time. Why? So that the latecomers wouldn't interrupt his reading. So that was the funny thing about it. After the, after the reading, we had lunch with students and members of the Irish community as Aidan Boyle, Robert Bird, Robert Bird, and Sister Helen, one nun living in Sao Paulo. And the, the, the restaurant was in the middle of uh, the Mapa Atlântica, and Paul was delighted to see all that exotic vegetation. And he was very much impressed uh, with the bamboo trees, very big, enormous. 
And he asked Sister Helen to take a photograph. Mariana, will you show the photograph? To show the moment that that moment registered and then he sent the photo to me. Could you so Aidan Boyle, myself, Paul, Paul, Robert Baird, who died here in Brazil. He was an engineer, an Irish engineer. Uh, Betty, Fernanda, and I don't know who he, this is, an Irishman. So it was a really very happy moment, which I treasure. Now you must imagine that 25 years have gone by. In 2019, Paul Birken was 75. I felt that we should honor his achievement with a base journal. But we needed guest editors. And Alan has told you the coincidence, how things happen. He came to Sao Paulo, he said hello from Paul, and I told him that I needed a guest editor. And he said yes, generously, and so did Mariana. And so this great team, thank you, Alan, thank you, Mariana, thank you, Laura, for helping us making this dream come true. To conclude my memories, of course, I have many more, but to conclude all these years, I have been reading, rereading, I have studied, I have discussed Paul Durkin's poems in the classroom, at conferences, in publications, and my admiration for Paul Durkin, for his art, is immense. And my gratitude for his friendship have been translated with the help of Alan and Mariana and Lauda into this volume, our present for Paul. Thank you. Thank you so much, Manila. Uh, I have to say, uh, th what, what a wonderful trip down memory lane, a really beautiful uh, uh, and an illuminating uh, sense of, of Paul's time here and 25 years ago. One only has to hear and see how how passionate you are uh, and how, how, how wonderful a friendship and relationship it's been over those 25 years. And as you say, you have now given him the perfect present, uh, I think, uh, to celebrate his 76th birthday. Uh, I really I really liked your, 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 your turn of phrase that he lived through many unexpected turns. I thought it was a really lovely turn of phrase and, and, and one that perfectly describes, I think, uh, Paul and, 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 and his life and his works uh, uh, in, in, terms of, in terms of how he uh, presented himself and presented uh, his poetry. As you say, and I've, I've, I've been fortunate enough, fortunate enough to listen and to see uh, Alan Gilsman's uh, documentary, and he definitely comes alive when he's reading his poetry. 
So with that in mind, I might ask, I think Alan might be sharing with us uh, one of uh, Paul's poems, Hymn to My Father. And if I can just say before that, if I'm right in saying, Alan, uh, Paul Durkin mentioned once that he would like to have been Rocky Marciano. Uh, and uh, there's no doubt that Paul had a tough, a tough battle in life in many ways with, with family. And I think this this this, uh, this hymn to his father is is a really a really beautiful way of putting that out uh, so that, uh, that others can can understand and experience it. So thanks, Alan. Right, thanks, Laura. Dear Daddy, on your last legs now. Can you hear me in your bedroom in the treetops, chained to your foot warmer and your pills, death notices in newspapers, your exclusive reading. We had no life together, or almost none. Yet you made me what I am, a man in search of his Russia. After school days, I became a poet, a metamorphosis you could no more fathom than I could fathom your own osmosis, lawyer with a secret life, as secret as the life of a poet. You had a history for every milestone, a saga for every place name, the Bovril sign, the ballast office clock, the broadstone. And so, at your knee, at your elbow, I became you. Estranged as we are, I am glad that it was in this life I loved you, not the next. O oh, Russian night at the crossroads, if you turn to the right, you will lose your horse. To the left, your head. If you go straight on, your life. If you were me, which you are, night at the crossroads, you would go home to Russia this very night. Thank you. Thank you, Laura. Uh, I think uh, if I can use the words of, of, of Ivor Brown, who was a very close friend of, of, of Paul Durkin, uh, when he says that when you hear Paul Durkin reading his poetry, you re really appreciate his genius. The words seem to come alive when he reads. I think after hearing that, we really get that sense that his words do truly. Uh, you can feel, uh, Paul, you can feel uh, how, how he, uh, he, he sort of sort of joined life and joined life with it, all of us in terms of his words and his poetry. So in, in going on to our next speaker, uh, and thanks Munira again for that lovely and wonderful trip down memory lane, a real, a real pleasure for myself as somebody who, who is just new uh, to Brazil to get that sense. So thank you so much. Uh, so just to introduce our next speaker, uh, who, who many of you will have known and Laura uh, uh, mentioned her earlier in, in, in the session, uh, Dr. Mariana Bolfarin. Uh, Dr. Bolfarin holds a PhD from the University of Sao Paulo, and she was a research fellow at the National University of Ireland in Maynooth. She combines her teaching at the Federal University of Rodanopolis uh, in Mato Grosso with her research role uh, at, the, uh, at the WBH chair. She is also head of the Brazilian Association of Irish Studies, or a Bay, as, as, as we know it. Uh, and reflecting on the art of translation that I touched on earlier, Dr. Bofrain has translated into Portuguese so some, some many, some many wonderful uh, translations, including Roger Casement in Brazil, uh, Robert the Amazon and the Atlantic World, 80, 1884 to 1916, and the Amazon Journal of Roger Casement, uh, 2016. Uh, of course, Roger Casement and the Secrets from Putumayo will feature in tomorrow's uh, program. But ahead of this, and as we continue this morning's discussion on, on the journal and Paul Durkin, uh, I'll pass over to Mariano, who will share with us some insights on the journal itself uh, and its structures. So, Mariano, over to you. Okay. Um, thank you, Consul Owen, for such a generous um, introduction. And I am genuinely honored to be here this morning to talk with you about the making of this exceptional piece of work, which is the special issue of the Brazilian Journal of Irish Studies as a way to celebrate Irish poet Paul Durkin's 76th birthday. I will begin by reading the short poem, uh, Casa Mariana Trauma, written uh, after Durkin's trip to Minas Gerais, and it depicts uh, Elizabeth Bishop's home whose photo is in the preface of the tribute. Casa Mariana Trauma, 
Paul Durkan. Under her window in Ouro Preto, she's ringing locutions, ringing shrunken, faded, threadbare words to squeeze oil paint out of tubes of language. The trauma of the painter as poet. And now the translation by José Roberto O'Shea. Trauma na Casa Mariana. Debaixo de sua janela em ouro preto, ele torce locuções, torce palavras, desbotadas, esfarrapadas, para espremer tinta a olho de tubos de linguagem. O trauma da pintora como poeta. This is just to give you a hint of uh, the poems that comprise um, this volume, uh, whose idea uh, dates back to 2019 at the ISL conference in Dublin, when Professor Munira Mutran shared with me her thoughts of celebrating Paul Durkin's life and work. Although I had, of course, been acquainted with his poetry before, the more I read the more I wanted to know about this man whose unique life experience is so deeply imprinted in his words. If truth be told, editing this special issue was one of the highlights of 2020 for me. It was during the COVID-19 pandemic, amongst so much uncertainty, loneliness, and witnessing the suffering of loved ones, that the exchanges which took place between Munira, Alan, and myself, each one of us at a different co corner of the country and of the globe, became to me a remedy against the isolation to which we were all subjected. The discussions about the volume were at times the most awaited moments of the week. I was able to find refuge in Durkin's poems, in the translations, and in the recollections by his friends and admirers. Reading Man Walking the Stairs, What Shall I Wear, Darling, for the Great Hunger, The Last Shuttle to Rio, Going Home to Mayo, Winter 1949, to mention a few, brought tears to my eyes, but also gave me hope, as Ambassador Sean Hoy also uh, remarked. As Monita has mentioned, what stands out in this volume and what makes it so special is that it offers both an Irish and an outsider's perspective, which reveals the wide reach of Durkin's work. As a traveler, he has been to so many places and experienced everyday situations which can be humorous, satirical, and at the same time, poignant and touching. All of the parts that inform the journal are, int are intricately connected. Um, as Consul Owen Benes mentioned also uh, in his uh, introduction, I will call attention to, um, to Alan Gilson's text um, in the introduction of the journal, which offers a glimpse of Durkin the man, Durkin the poet, and the Durkin who participated in the song and lyrics of The Days Before Rock and Roll by Van Morrison. And I became literally obsessed by this performance, watching the video over and over and listening to his voice. As general editor of the Brazilian Journal of Fire Studies, I can only express uh, my deep gratitude to all those involved. Professor Munira Mutran, Alan Gilsonen, of course, Lauri Zaha, who is also general editor of the journal, uh, Victor Augusto Pacheco, and to all the contributors for sharing our enthusiasm in embarking on this adventure. My final thanks go to the William Butler Yates Chair of Virus Studies and, of course, to the Immigrant Support Program, which um, financially supports the journal. And I hope, of course, you'll all enjoy. Thank you. Many thanks, Mariana. And I can assure you that I'm also a keen fan of Van Morrison, as I am sure there are. Are, are others in in, the, in this virtual room? So so thanks for for, for bringing that memory and and thanks also for your uh, your words and and very interesting words on the journal itself, the structures and how this came to being. Uh, I, I think and having having gone through this journal and the previous journal uh, focused on John Banville, I, I, I the work that goes into this, uh, the linking up 
of the various elements of, of each person's life is just incredible. And I think it's a real, it's a, it's a real, uh, it's a real gift that you give to to not just Brazil, like I mentioned before, but to the world in terms of Irish studies. But before before we introduce our, our final speaker for today, I, I would like to introduce our next poem, uh, "Him to a Broken Marriage." Again, another opportunity to really to really sense the person that that is Paul Durkin. Uh, so if I can ask Laura to to play uh, the next the next clip. Thank you. Dear Nessa, now that our marriage is over, I would like you to know that if I could put back the clock, 15 years to the cold March day of our wedding, I would wed you again. And if that marriage also broke, I would wed you yet again. And if it a third time broke, wed you again and again and again and again and again. If you would have me, which of course you would not, for even you, in spite of your patience and your innocence, strange characteristics in an age such as our own, even you require to shake off the addiction of romantic love and seek instead the herbal remedy of a sane affection in which are mixed in profuse and fair proportion loverliness, brotherliness, fatherliness. A sane man could not espouse a more intimate friend than you. A, a, a real, a real sense of of Paul Durkin's love and continuing love for his his uh, his 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 wife uh, Nessa. Uh, if I can, and when I was watching Alan's film, and uh, I'll introduce Alan now, I, I was really taken by the fact that uh, that Paul Durkin mentioned that his life really took off in that moment where he met Nessa, and that he, as he says, he got permission to fully live and breathe and become sort of some sort of grown up. I just thought it was a lovely, uh, a lovely way to to introduce his wife uh, through your documentary. And, and that brings us to our, our last speaker. And uh, as with other previous speakers, I don't think uh, we need to to give uh, introductions to Alan Gilson. And he's, he's known to many in the room. Uh, and as Munira said, there was a coincidence uh, as such, and he became one of the guest editors for, for this special issue journal. Uh, just to give you a little sense of Alan, for those who might not know Alan, uh, he's a, a well-renowned Irish writer, filmmaker and theatre director. His most recent works include the cinema documentary Meetings with Ivor, the feature film Unless, based on the novel by Carol Shields, and The Meeting, which he wrote and directed and premiered in the 2018 Dublin Film Festival. As the former chairperson of the Irish Film Film Institute, he has also served on the Irish Film Board and on the board of the International Dance Festival Ireland. In, ad in addition to this, and with this current journal in mind, Alan is a good friend of Paul Durkin and offers the reader a wonderful sense of Durkin and his works through both his excellent contributions to this journal, as well as the wonderful TV documentary made about the life of Paul Durkin. It is, it, it, it is through this learned lens that I, I look forward to, to, to hearing from Alan and hearing about uh, his, his friendship with both Paul, but Paul the person and Paul the poet are as Seamus Heaney simply referred to him, Poet Durkin. So maybe if we can pass over to you, Alan, just for some, some words and we may ask some questions then. Thank you. Thanks again, Owen. Uh, real, real genuine pleasure to be with you all today. And, and you know, I, I, I'm touched Owen, oh, there at the end of your remarks that you you mentioned uh, that Seamus Heaney would always uh, uh, address Paul as the poet Durkin, and and that that sense of the poet is very important to Paul. That sense of a, a society's respect for the poet, which I think we do have in Ireland, and this journal I think is a great gesture of respect and love, and uh, I know that Paul really kind of is profoundly moved by the efforts that everybody's made, by all the contributors who who just, the extraordinary translations of his work, um, the, the, the essays, the reflections, uh, I think Paul is really, really touched by that, you know, and one of the things that struck me when we embarked on this journey is that Paul's 75th birthday passed reasonably unnoticed in Ireland. 
Um, and that's partly because I think Paul shies away from the limelight uh, uh, sometimes, and I'd say this to him himself, you know, that he can be his own worst enemy in that. Um, but it is that somehow Paul has always been an outsider. And I think that's intrinsic in his personality and in his work. Um, he told me recently, with great pleasure, uh, we were talking about a period in Dublin, you know, 50s, 60s, 70s, around an area that could be called Bagatonia, which was that there was a kind of cultural explosion uh, in an underground way in, in that area around uh, the Grand Canal in Dublin, Bagot Street, Pembroke Road, uh, the area that Paul grew up as a child, um, an area now that's a very affluent uh, kind of the prestigious centre of of Dublin in some ways. Uh, but in those days, it was a little more probably down at heel. Uh, it was a place where there were a lot of bedsits and apartments and this burgeoning uh, cultural community uh, sort of came alive under the radar uh, in the shadow, of course, of Yeats and Joyce. Um, but it was into that world that Paul, who was a bit younger, obviously, grew up uh, on, on Dartmouth Square, uh, a square close by that he talks about in a lot of his work. Um, and one of the characters that influenced him as a very young man, as a very young poet, was, of course, the great Irish poet, Patrick Kavanagh, um, who, who I remember, because I grew up in that area too, on, on the mythical Raglan Road, uh, immortalized in Kavanagh's poem, of course, in the song. Um, but as a very, very young child, I remember Kavanagh as this kind of odd, slightly scary figure who, who wandered around uh, Pembroke Road. Uh, as I would be dragged by my father up to Mass uh, in Huntington Road Church, how the times have changed. Um, but Paul, at that time, and I'm obviously joining the dots now retrospectively, uh, would have been a young poet who emerged out of, you know, a relatively conservative background in Dublin. His father uh, was, was a judge, you know, quite maybe not a stern man, but a man of his time, a conservative man. Um, and one thing I would like to touch on, because there is all, there's been a lot of discussion and debate around Paul's relationship with his mother and father. His mother, as Susan mentioned, a Mayo woman who he idolized, who was this shining golden light that runs throughout his work. And his father, that was this dark, foreboding uh, presence. Um, and I, I think, and, and I think it's fair to say that some of Paul's wider family disagree with his narrative on that, uh, as as in all families there are disagreements. But one of the things that's worth mentioning in that poem, uh, which we played earlier, is that it is also a love poem to his father. And you know, even though they were horrendously different in attitudes and clashed as father and sons might. Uh, you know, there is a deep, profound love there. And you can trace that throughout the poems, the fewer poems that he writes about his father. And little moments, I remember him telling me once about his father, who was this, as I mentioned, kind of stern judge figure, walked him down on his birthday to Grafton Street in the centre of Dublin, uh, and without saying anything, bought him a copy of Sergeant Pepper, the Beatles' famous album. And, you know, so there were lovely moments of love. And I, I mentioned that because so much of the narrative around the discussion of Paul's work is, is maybe to undermine that relationship with his father. Anyway, to return to, to, to Kavanagh and the young Durkin, and he met Kavanagh, and he only told me this recently, that Kavanagh said in a conversation, he said, he said, I place all my faith in Durkin. And that meant huge amount to Paul. Even today, in his 76th year, you can even see his pride in that. And I think he is, in, in a literary sense, he is in the tradition of the artist as outsider, uh, a bit like Kavanagh and many others. The person who is on the fringes of society, uh, but who is also uh, a guardian to us all, somebody who shows us the way 
uh, away from the kind of trippings of respectable society and hypocrisy and comes to the core, to the emotional core of, of things. And that's one of his, his greatest uh, uh, tributes, I think. Um, I was struck by Mariana talking about the Van Morrison song in the days before rock and roll. Uh, and it just reminded me, and I, I think I talk about it in the journal, but one of my uh, favorite and eternal images of, of Paul was on his 75th birthday. I was driving out to a small birthday celebration, bringing him out. And we were on the a sort of motorway that drives south uh, from Dublin. And we passed St. John of God's Psychiatric Hospital, uh, which is somewhere that Paul has uh, inhabited in his, in his early years. Uh, and is a kind of dark cloud, I, I think, in his imagination. And, and that's something we dealt with in the film, uh, the dark school that the clips are from. But as we move beyond that, he said, let's pull in to the Galloping Green pub. Um, and uh, he said, we'll just, he, he had memories. You know, one of the things that I talk about in, in my little essay is, is the fact that the landscape, and I think Manira talked touched on this in terms of his journey to Brazil, that the landscape is alert with memory. You know, that when you're with Paul, you have a feeling, first of all, of extraordinary sensitivity to everything around you, to people, because Paul has that sensitivity, but also a profound awareness of the past, the present, and maybe even the future coexisting in time. And wherever you go in Dublin with Paul, he'll have a memory oh, that's where I saw such and such in 1968. You know, it's very specific. But he had a similar memory about the Galloping Green pub. And we pulled in, and just as I was about to turn off the engine, uh, Arena, which is uh, an Irish radio program, arts program, came on and started with uh, a lovely tribute to Paul. And then they played Van Morrison's uh, in, in the days before rock and roll. And we sat in the car with the commuter traffic flying by us and, and Paul starts to sing in that hypnotic way he has sometimes when he reads with the head down and the rhythm starts to come out of him and it was just one of those beautiful moments and also beautiful for Paul because he felt there was some public acknowledgement of his role as, as the poet and, and, and this journey is, is part of that and the huge investment. I mean, Manira and Mariana have been very gracious and generous to me, but I know I was only a mere altar boy in proceedings that, uh, you know, the huge work that Mariana and Munira put into this was quite colossal. And I know that that does mean and will mean uh, an awful lot to, to Paul when I deliver the journal physically to him. Uh, he, he'll be delighted. Um, just as I was thinking about today, I, I realized that it's probably 20 years uh, that I've known Paul, not not always as a close friend. We met um, when I made a short film of one of his early poems, Six Nuns Die in a Convent Inferno. And then later on in 2007, uh, I made a documentary, which was which the clips are from, um, called The Dark School. And uh, that was an extraordinary engagement with Paul because anybody who knows him, and Manira mentions the door being held open at the reading, he is very specific about things. So when I sat down to discuss maybe making a film, uh, he was very specific. He sat down, he said, Alan, I want to do the years 1974 to 1977. End of story, no debate. Um, and that was, as Owen mentioned, concluded with his marriage to Nessa and his two lovely daughters, which sort of transformed his life. Uh, uh, but also it was on the advent of him becoming a poet. Um, and that was, as the title suggests, a dark period in his life, a life of uh, struggles with the conservative world he grew up in, struggles to be a poet, uh, health struggles, uh, mental health struggles. Um, and Paul wants to really invest and tell that, share that story. Um, and as I remember that film and even the title, The Dark School, which is one of his poems, 
Um, sometimes I find when I discuss Paul, and, and he is a man, you can see his face, you know, when the clip came up without the voice, uh, his face almost tells a parallel story to his poems. You know, that it is the face of, there is pain in it, uh, there is darkness in it. Um, and often I find I talk about Paul in those terms, but Manira made a really vital point earlier when she talked about his sense of humor, his sense of joy, his sense of performance. Um, I can remember doing an event in the Gate Theatre in Dublin with Paul, uh, and we were backstage and he was riddled with nerves and anxiety and almost like you could not imagine him going on to do the reading. But then he came on uh, to huge applause uh, and he is suddenly electric. And suddenly you forget always, first of all, how funny Paul is, the sense of humor, the extraordinary uh, performance ability. You know, he kind of in some way often to me echoes the, uh, you know, the great actor Robin Williams, but he has this extraordinary uh, chameleon-like ability to perform his poems. And, and you then realize, I suppose, the joy of Paul that goes alongside the darkness and the despair uh, and the angst, that there is great humor, there's great joy. Um, and when I was thinking back on, on, on the little films that I've done with him, you know, that even the first film, which was based on six nuns die in a convent in Inferno, which was about a, a very tragic fire in a Loretto convent in Stevens Green in 1986. And I was reminded when I looked back at that, that even though, you know, you, you think nuns and conservatism, and but what's in the poems alongside the tragedy, which he really captures beautifully, uh, and alongside, uh, you know, a certain humor in that, a certain surreal quality that he always has, but there's huge compassion. There is huge warmth and generosity and compassion in him. And that alongside the joy and that ability to be humorous and funny um, is very much part of the complexity of Paul, you know, and it's very easy either in an academic setting or in a, uh, you know, an, an art setting to, to see him only as the outsider, the angst ridden, the tortured artist, uh, and, and to forget the twinkle in his eye, you know, the joy, um, the delight in people, um, the delight in places, in history, in uh, in all the things that, you know, Manira talked about earlier. And that's really essential that, that we remember that in Paul, that, that beautiful sense of, of personality. Um, it, it's interesting that he, he, you know, Joyce has come up a few times and, and he mentions Joyce uh, both in his poems, in, in uh, greetings from, to our friends in Brazil, but also in his, his little message today. And, and one of my most recent experiences with Paul was when I was making a film of Ulysses for uh, the new Museum of Literature Ireland, which is a beautiful museum next door to the Department of Foreign Affairs uh, head office for Sean and Owen. And um, for a long time, I was making a visual film uh, in a way, a kind of response to the book, uh, if such a thing is possible, which of course it's not. But um, I remember uh, thinking and racking, what was I going to do with the voice of Joyce? And I remember driving down Sandy Mount Strand, which was mentioned earlier, with, with Paul, and he started to talk about uh, being a young poet with Michael Hartnett, and the two of them walk in Sandy Dumont Strand and fantasizing about being James Joyce. You know, that Joyce was truly the poet. And of course, there's connections there, the different voices, the theatricality, the surreal elements that, that you can see that he is in that sort of Joycean lineage, genuinely. Um, and, and of course, often the best ideas are the obvious ones that you have missed all along. 
you know, it was it was that Paul would would read the passages from the book that I was using, uh, and that was a real joy, you know. And and at one point, when Paul agreed to do it, he mentioned casually that since we discussed it, he read Ulysses seven times, and it is that forensic uh, attention to detail that he has, but also that great generosity of spirit not just to the great writers you know to the 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 superstars of our literary canon like Joyce and Yeats and but but to other writers writers that have been forgotten his many tributes to other writers in his books like his tribute to Manera and and with that you you kind of remember his his generosity and his his sense that he is at home with friends that I think the world to him, sometimes can be a hostile place, a frightening place, as it is to all of us, probably at different times in our life, if we did it. Um, and it's funny for a man who doesn't really like to travel, you know, sometimes it's hard to get Paul out of the house, um, that he has made these pilgrimages to Russia, to Brazil, and that they have been so profound. And it is, there's something in Paul in his work that place doesn't matter, people do. That's where home is. And so I thought I might just finish with a little poem of his, the end of a little poem, which made me think of his friends in Brazil, of, of Manira and all the people uh, that he remembers so fondly. Um, and it's, it's a poem in a recent collection, um, Praise in Which I Live and Move and Have My Being. Who else would come up with a title like that? But it's a poem about him envying the homeless man, again, the outsider on the street. Uh, and he concludes that if I had a gram of his integrity, his courage, his independence, even in these last years of my life, I might make a go of it, sing. As I've always yearned to sing the song of my silence, the song of the men and women I love, of the places that make me feel at home. And that sense of home and that sense of love, I think, are very central uh, to you all uh, and to Paul. And, uh, you know, on the eve of St. Patrick's Day, uh, it's lovely just to share a little bit of that hope and love from Paul. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. I felt like I was sitting next to him. Uh, it really felt so powerful. Uh, and, I, I, and I would love, uh, and I will remember if I ever get a chance to go into the Galloping Green, having gone past it many times on the Slogan Road, I will go in and I will think of, of Paul and your moment there. I think his life has been full of just unbelievable moments, uh, some tough, uh, some wonderful, some, so, so, some even better again. Uh, and I think uh, we don't have we don't have time for questions, but if I can just sort of finish uh, to say thank you, Alan, thank you to Monira, thank you to Mariana, and thank you for to Lara in the background for making this possible, because I think it's been a, a wonderful celebration. I really believe that it's been uh, uh, a 76th birthday to remember for Paul, and while he's not a uh, custodian of the virtual world like many of us, uh, I, I'm sure that you will relay our, our best wishes to him, Alan, and you will relay the, the, the very, the very uh, sort of words of friendship that were expressed here today and, and the wonderful sense of Paul the man and Paul the poet. Uh, I think, uh, as I mentioned in my opening remarks, I think this 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 treasured birthday gift is uh, is, a, is a perfect greeting to a friend in Ireland uh, from those here in Brazil. Uh, and if I can just finish with one last uh, sort of uh, idea or, or sort of image of, of, of Paul Durkin, and it's in it's in your film, Alan, when he's on the the train and he's been all over the world, but he's been on the train. He was on the train from Dublin to Cork. Uh, with his two daughters and he said one daughter said cow and the other said bullock and he, he sits back and he goes life was new and starting all over again i think that's a, a perfect way to to bring our round table to a close uh, it's been really wonderful to have you all here with us i hope you enjoyed and we will finish with a final uh, passage or clip from uh, paul durkin uh, that was uh, as part of alan's uh, alan gilsman's uh, film. So thank you so much and enjoy the rest of the, the program over today and tomorrow uh, and I will see you all again tomorrow. Thank you so much.
They liked me when I was on the wing and I could whistle and I could sing. But now that I am in my bed of clay, they come no more to be with me. It was on the main road halfway between Newcastle West and Abbey Field. A juggernaut glanced me as it passed me by, and that was the end of the road for me. Later that day, as I lay on the verge, a thin rake of a young man picked me up into his trembling hands, and he stared at me. Full quarter of an hour, he stared at me, and then he laid me down, and with his hands scooped me a shallow grave. His soul passed into me as he covered me o'er. I fear for him now, where'er he be. They liked me when I was on the wing, and I could whistle and I could sing. But now that I am in my bed of clay, they come no more to be with me. Okay, thank you very much, um, all of you, Owen, for sharing this inspiring session full of emotion, memor memories, and Paul Durkin's poetry uh, live, I would say, because it is as if he is with us at this moment. Thank you, Munira. Thanks, Alan. Thanks, Mariana, for giving us this beautiful present in our opening of the activities of the chair. I think, as I said at the very beginning uh, of uh, the opening session, um, the program is indeed the result of all these long years um, uh, working and researching and sharing all the the passion that we have in doing Irish literature and also Irish studies. So thanks a lot, Susan, also for your poem, uh, uh, Sean, and we will, and Adrian is also here. And